And I mean everything is alleged, honey. Unlike my other videos, this video is most, if not all, gossip and tea. Oh, and um, y'all might want to get ready to turn y'all volume now because I'm finna show enough try to sing one of her songs. So let's get to it. But only now my love has grown And do I love you, my oh my Yes, river deep, mountain high Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> If I lost you, would I cry? Shouts! Oh, how I love you, baby Come on in the room and sit down. I thought about this one over and over, but I ain't scared of you, mother suckers. Now, come on. Let's get to it. This is Ashley with Ashley Says So, and I am back today with another Old Hollywood Scandals video. Go ahead and put on your boxing gloves because this video is about Miss Tina Turner. Let's get to it. Tina Turner was born Anna Mae Bullock on November the 16th, 1939 in Brownsville, Tennessee. She was the youngest daughter of Zelma Priscilla Bullock, and Floyd Richard Bullock. Her two older sisters' names were Evelyn Juanita Curry and Ruby Eileen Bullock. While all three girls were still very young, they were separated from each other when their parents moved to Knoxville, Tennessee during World War II. I'm not sure where the two elder sisters went to stay, but I do know that Tina went to stay with her paternal grandparents, Roxana and Alex Bullock. And these grandparents were very, very religious and very, very strict. After the war was over, Tina, her sisters, and her parents were all reunited into one big happy family, and they moved to Nutbush, Tennessee. And this was one of the smoothest periods of Tina's childhood. She had great fun during this time, and she also joined the local church choir. But this was not to last. Around two years later, when Tina was about 11 years old, her mother Zelma ran off and left the family without warning. But it was later found that she had great reason to leave because the father Floyd was beating on Zelma constantly. And people most likely would have praised her for leaving a very abusive man, but there was a problem. She left her children behind. It was around this time that Tina says she felt very unwanted. And she doubled that feeling about two years later in 1952 when her father Floyd left his girls as well. He remarried and he moved with his new wife to Detroit. Tina and her sisters again were sent to live with a grandparent. This time it was Miss Georgiana Curry and she lived in Brownsville, Tennessee. As the years passed by, I believe that Eileen was actually called to St. Louis to live with her mother. Whatever arrangements were made for Eileen, the same were not made for Tina and Evelyn. Although Tina was sad at being pushed aside to live with her grandparents, she was navigating life as a regular child. And at school, she was a social butterfly. She played basketball, she cheered, and some would say she was a little bit too social, honey. Let me go ahead and drop some T-bombs real early. By the time Tina had got to high school, there was a lot of gossip going around that she was a very, very fast girl. Not only were there other children saying this, their parents were also saying it. They said that she was a party girl. She drank and danced, she went out with several guys, and at the end of the night, she usually gave in to those guys' requests, if you know what I mean. But there was one guy that little Anna Mae had her eyes on and he wasn't paying her any attention, and that was Mr. Harry Taylor. Y'all know how it is, especially if you live in a little bitty local small town. It's always this one dude that got it going on, you know. All the guys wanna be like him, all of the females like him. And Tina wanted him, but he had his pick up all of the girls. That was okay though, she was not giving up. And eventually, she put her moves on him and she did get him wrapped around her little finger. But their relationship did not last for very long because soon Tina found out that Harry had impregnated another girl and he actually married this other girl while he was still dating Tina. She dropped him like a hot potato. Tina was still a teenager when her eldest sister Evelyn died in a car wreck alongside two cousins. Their names were Margaret and Vila Evan. And then at 16 years old, her grandmother passes away and she has nobody else to look after her, so she moves to St. Louis where her mother Zelma is staying. And when she gets there, 
baby she starts clowning acting a fool she going out she drinking she clubbing she partying sleeping all day trying to do whatever she wants to do in the night basically trying to live like she's an adult and nobody can tell her what to do well mama zelman was like no ma'am you're not about to be doing all this First of all, you need to behave yourself and act like a young lady. Second of all, you need to get a job. But Anna Mae was not receiving of this because who do you think you're talking to, Miss Zelma? You were gone, you've been gone. You basically pushed me aside. You basically said, forget me as your child and you came up here and did what you wanted to do. So now all of a sudden you wanna act like you care about you know what I'm doing out here. You wanna all of a sudden discipline me and become a mom and no, I'm not having it. And Tina was not having it. As a matter of fact, she totally did not listen to her mom and she continued to frequent nightclubs. And she was not going out to these parties and clubs alone. She was actually going with her elder sister, Eileen. And Eileen was a party girl herself. Now, she had already been living in St. Louis, so she already knew all the hot spots, she knew all the groups to hang out with, and she knew several bands. And some of those people that she knew were members of the Kings of Rhythm, Ike Turner's band. In fact, Eileen was actually dating the drummer, and his name was Eugene Washington. So one night, Eileen says to Anna Mae, come with me to the Manhattan Club tonight. The Kings of Rhythm will be playing there. Eugene will be on the drums and you can meet a few guys that's in the band. So Anna Mae is like, okay, and they go to the club together. And when she gets there, that is the very first time that she lays eyes on Ike Turner. And she is floored. She is mesmerized by the tall, skinny, bird-like, but very handsome Ike Turner. And that description of Ike Turner is an Easter egg. For the people who bought my book, y'all remember me saying that in the book? Okay, let's move on. So as I just stated before, Tina is totally taken aback by Ike Turner. So that means every song he's singing, you know, she's singing alone, dancing, woo, sweating, having a good old time, scooching to the front of the club, trying to make sure his eye is on her. And Ike is on stage just playing his guitar and singing and just, woo, mm, yeah, mama, woo, hot lady, there you go, you know. And then suddenly he goes, uh, excuse me, ma'am, ma'am, you shaking like a leaf in front of everybody. Can you move out the way so I can look at the lady behind you? Yes, that's right. Ike Turner was not interested in Anime Bullock at all. And it makes sense because he was the leader of the band. He had women throwing themselves at him. Like he was top of the line, so he had his pick. So everything that she was doing was not flattering him. He was not fascinated by her because plenty of women had done these same moves to get his attention. But although her gyrating hips and heavy breathing did not catch Ike's attention, there was somebody else on that stage that was paying very, very close attention. And his name was Raymond Hill, known then as Spider. Now, Spider was the saxophone player for the Kings of Rhythm and a very good friend to Ike Turner. And he did not waste any time letting little Anna Mae know exactly how he felt about her and they started dating. Now let me go ahead and put a little scandal in this, honey. Although Tina started dating Raymond or Spider, whatever you wanna call him, she always wanted Ike Turner. So I hate to say this, but Raymond, Spider, he was kinda used as a placeholder until she can get what she was really trying to get. And because this was the case, Spider could sense very quickly that he was second best in Tina's eyes. I mean, she was doing things like flirting with Ike in front of his face. Now, Tina likes to say that she and Ike had a brother-sister type relationship, but word on the street is that that is not really what it was. Like, she was... I hate to say this, y'all, I truly do, but I'm gonna tell y'all the tea. She was basically like a groupie when it came to Ike. And let me give you an example. Let's say that Ike and Spider are having a conversation. And Ike says, um, you know, man, I like the Red Sox. They better than the Pirates. And then Spider will say something like, you know, no, nah, the Pirates, that's my, that's my team. Well, here come Tina. Uh-uh, I like the Red Sox. I like the Red Sox. Ike, you right. You right, because they are good. Doing stuff to flatter him and stroke his ego. You know what I'm saying? She had her eyes on the prize. Along with this very flirtatious behavior, it was also one night while she was dating Spider in 1957 that she jumped on stage with Ike. And she jumped on stage and she started singing, you know, strutting her stuff. Ike liked what he saw. He loved the fact that she knew how to get the crowd riled up and he loved the fact that the crowd responded to her and he kept her on stage to sing that whole night. And this is when he recognized, okay, 
I kind of like this girl. And it was mainly because he felt like she would bring him money. He felt like she would be a great investment. So she had to bring a little more than tail to the table. And when he saw that she could bring more than that, little Ann started to get sexier and sexier to Mr. Ike Turner. Even though Raven could recognize that Tina really wanted Ike, he still didn't go anywhere. Like he still kept messing around with her and dating her. And soon she became pregnant with his child in 1958. Remember how I was saying that she and I were more like brother and sister, their relationship was very platonic? Well, how could this be? Because when she got pregnant with Spider's baby, a lady named Lorraine Taylor, which was Ike's living girlfriend at the time, thought so much that that baby was Ike's baby that this lady pulled a gun out and shot herself because she was so filled with jealousy and with rage thinking that Ike had cheated on her and got this little girl pregnant that she shot herself because she was that much heartbroken. Now, of course, it turned out that that baby was not Ike's, but that to me puts a tent over all that platonic brother and sister stuff because ain't nobody finna pull out a gun and shoot themselves over their mate just being brotherly or sisterly to somebody. No, if they're gonna go to that extreme, they basically know that those people have something going on. Now, it was 1958 when Tina gave birth to her first son, Craig, and I'm not sure if it was before or after Craig's birth that Spider left and abandoned her. Apparently, he was on stage um, playing around doing a wrestling match at one of the clubs or something like that, and he broke his ankle. And he told Tina, well, I'm gonna go and leave out of town to go back and live with my family until my ankle heals, and I'll be back to be with you and little Craig. Y'all know Spider ain't come back. Spider went on down there and married somebody else, child. Just sorry, trifling. But it didn't matter too much anyway, because as we all know, Tina was not interested in anyway. So bye, Spider. Ain't nobody worried about you. So Spider is gone and little Anime Bullock is completely single. And Anime Bullock can sing. And these things look very, very good to Ike Turner because he had basically made her a part of his band now. So she was singing with him. And you know, they had a lot of rehearsals and a whole bunch more flirting going on. People can sense that she and Ike sooner or later are gonna be an item. But what, honey? When Tina and Ike actually did get intimate and get in a relationship, the way it went down, they know they ought to be ashamed of themselves, honey. Let me tell you about it. So apparently, Tina was over at Ike's house. She left baby Craig over at her mother Zelma's and she would come over there to party with the band. By the end of the night, Ike tells her that she doesn't have to go home. You know what I'm saying? It's a bedroom upstairs. You can stay here with me if you want to. And Tina is like, okay. And so she stays, goes up in the room, gets in the bed. Once she gets in the bed, another musician that played with the Kings of Rhythm supposedly came into the room, tried to get some from her, you know, tried to push up on her, rub up on her, and Tina told him no, and he left the room. But she was afraid that he would come back and try to take it from her. So she leaves that room and she runs and jumps in the bed with Ike in his room. Now, this is where things get murky and very, very messy. Because here's the thing. Lorraine was in the house with them, okay? Some people say that she was in another room very close to the room Ike and Tina were in, and then some people say that she was not in another room, that Ike was in the bed with her, and Tina came and got in the bed with him and Lorraine. Baby, I know. Baby, I know, child, I know. I can't believe it. But whatever the case, whosever bed they were in, Tina ended up feeling safe and sound. Not only did she feel safe and sound, honey, she felt hot and heavy too, baby, because they got it on. Now, I don't even know what to say, because if they did get it on beside a sleeping Lorraine, I got to take a breath, honey, because they better make sure that gun was hid, baby, because I guarantee if Lorraine would've woke up and saw that, it would've been Ike and Tina Turner laid on the floor dead. But most people believe the version that they were in a room beside Lorraine's and that is where everything went down. Either way it goes, let me tell you how grimy this thing gets. It is said that that was Lorraine's house, not Ike's house, that was Lorraine's house. Her family actually owned some factory over in St. Louis so she had a little bit of money and that was her house and Ike was living with her. So he had the audacity to have his side woman staying in there and messing with his side woman either in a room beside Lorraine or 
while he was sleeping beside Lorraine. I know y'all got y'all boxing gloves on. Don't punch me through the screen just yet. Let's find out some more tea, honey. So after this scandalous night passes by, they are pretty much an item now, okay? He eventually leaves Lorraine alone and he gets with Anime Bullock. They are a couple now. She is elevated and she starts getting all of the trappings that come along with being Ike Turner's main lady. Now, one of the things was having more money to do with what she wanted to do with. And they said Tina was always decked out in the latest fashion. It is also said that she had more say. Of course, not over Ike. He was head of the head. But she had a lot more say over other people. To show little anime just how important she was to Ike and his money, he renames her to Tina Turner. He lets her know that your name is no longer Anime Bullock, at least not out there. You are now Tina Turner. Ike Turner's wife. Here come more scandalous tea, honey. Tina fell in love with this, you know, and she wanted to make sure nobody would take this away from her. So baby, they said Tina was fighting women left and right. Honey, it's a rumor that she was even pregnant with her son, Ronnie, which is the only child she had by Ike. She was on stage singing at a little local black club, all right? And some girl out in the audience was like making faces at Ike or, you know, trying to talk to him, probably blowing kisses. Baby, that said Tina jumped off that stage and started beating up that woman, busting that woman all upside her head. They said Tina was giving it to her, honey. They had her on the floor choking that woman, child. Honey said it took about three, four folks to pull Tina off of that woman. And like I said, supposedly that is not the only incident. She was the queen and she was not letting anyone take her position. And speaking on people getting beat up, let's go ahead and get into the abuse that Tina suffered from Ike Turner. Tina says that the first time she experienced abuse from Ike is after they recorded Fool in Love, she told him she was done with the relationship and he didn't want her to go anywhere. So he took a wooden shoe stretcher and bopped her on top of the head with it. And that is when she experienced her first thing of abuse with Ike. But rumors say that Tina already knew Ike was abusive. She saw him abuse Lorraine. She saw him abuse some of his other women that he had. She also saw him abuse some of the male band members. And I say all this not to cover Ike because he did what he did and he was wrong for what he did, very wrong. No matter what happened, she didn't deserve that. But I'm trying to give you the context of what the streets are saying about Tina and Ike Turner. Let me go ahead and tell y'all, everything that I told y'all so far was just the start of the mess. Now it's time to get into the scandal for real. Baby, the old school street said that Ike and Tina were out here getting into everything. It is even said that Tina was as big a drug addict as Ike was. And they were both very, very wild and hard partiers. So hard that Tina supposedly was not above prostitution. Honey, they even out here saying that Ike was actually her procurer. That Ike would do things like, uh, hey, hey, Ann, Ann, come over here, come over here. Uh, th this white dude right here, he got, he got a lot of money in, got, got a lot of money in, and he say he, he just want to touch it. You know, he just wants you to lay down with him, go to bed with him, and go, go and do it, go and do it. And they said that Tina, in her high state, maybe even her sober state, saw dollar signs and she would perform acts of prostitution for money. I'ma get y'all the tea today, baby. Y'all came here for it, y'all finna get it. Baby, let me tell you something about these old Hollywood streets and how messy they get. I mean, they messy. They even touched on the cheating rumors between Ike and Tina. And they said that, yes, Ike did cheat on Tina all the time. And they said, yes, it probably hurt her in the beginning, but sooner or later, she was out there recruiting females for him to sleep with. Honey, them folks said she would pick a woman out of the audience that she thought Ike would like and that woman would be brought backstage to sleep with Ike. And here's where it gets messier. Y'all, I'm trying not to fall out. Cause honey, I fell out in the Aretha Franklin video, but I'm trying not to fall out in this video, but whoo! It's just getting real messy, y'all. Because listen now, the same rumors that are out on T.I. and Tiny today were out on Ike and Tina back then and still are out on Ike and Tina today. Child, they said that Ike and Tina would take them girls and drug them up and have their way with them. And if that last rumor didn't light a fire up under y'all, this one right here is definitely gonna get y'all blood boiling. Because baby, they said Tina was out here being Ike's bottom B, honey. They said that not only was Tina recruiting the girls for Ike to sleep with or for them to sleep with together, she was also recruiting the girls and sending them out so they can do prostitution 
prostitution as well and would fight these girls and basically jump on like pimping these girls out with Ike so they could bring in money. Even though we are talking about all of these rough and tough gossip rumors and how tough Tina was and everything that she did, all of this bad gossip, there is some gossip out there that shows a more fragile side of Tina. It is said that she really would be humiliated at one of the things that Ike used to do. He used to make love to her and then get up out of the bed after he was finished, go to another room in his studio where a woman had sat there and waited pretty much the whole day for him to come in there and make love love to that woman. This right here really did tear Tina down inside and humiliate her and I could see how it could. Back to the rumors of Ike beating on Tina and hitting on her for no reason, that is supposedly absolutely true. The gossip matches what Tina says about this, that he did used to beat on her all the time. But gossip says that Tina used to fight his tail back and I can understand that. They said that they actually used to fight each other. It was not just where he was beating on her and, and she would just take the beatings like a little whimpering coward or something like that. No, they said Tina had those dukes up and she would fight Ike right back. And sometimes she jumped on him, but not to the extreme or not to the extent that he was beating on her. And that is if you believe she jumped on him at all. Maybe she did jump on him once or twice when her feelings were hurt or when she got mad, but Ike was actually very severely abusive to her but like I said Tina fought him back like a man and out of all of the rumors gossip and tea in this video that is the one that I hope is true I hope she was whooping his tail when he came to jump on her I hope she was getting some good licks in and punching him all up in his face yes I do because he shouldn't have been jumping on no doggone body and now we're getting to the gossip of why Tina stayed why Tina endured this treatment for so long well she loved the money. She loved being on stage. She loved being the center of attention. So while she was still hot and the Ike and Tina Turner review were still hot, she stayed because there was something she could gain from it. Now let's touch on this studio a little bit. Ike had a studio built named Bolick Sound. He had it built in the 70s. And this studio was really something else. I mean, the black community and black people in general were very, very proud of it. They said it was equal to the Taj Mahal for the people in Inglewood. And that was from the point of view of the people that couldn't even go inside of the studio, okay? Now the people that could go inside of the studio, they had an even higher opinion of Bolick Sound. It was great. It was also a drug and orgy party going on in that studio every other day, if not every day. And a lot, lot, lot of stars, both black, white, Mexican, Chinese, anything you can name, came down and wanted to use that studio. They wanted to be a part of the atmosphere because it was very secure. They could do what they wanted to do, whether it was drugs or men sleeping with men and women sleeping with women. Like there's a lot that went down in that studio because the world would not know about it. Nobody would find out. It was just a bunch of famous people partying together. It had like reinforced steel doors and you had to know like a code to get into the doors. And when you got in there, there were security guards as well as a security system, metal detectors, it was just a lot of ropes that you had to climb through just to gain entry to the studio. And then when you got into the studio, you were just at the first level. That's it. Let's say you got into the first level. Okay, you're down there maybe in the lobby talking to people. Who knows? But then in order to get to like the party room or somewhere like that, you had to know a code that you had to punch into the wall and then the next set of doors would open for you. And a lot of people that came into the studio never got past that first level because I didn't think they were good enough to go to the other level. All kind of mess happened in this studio. All kind of nastiness, honey. And yes, Tina did experience some of that, but she did not experience a lot because she was not there a whole lot. She was at home with the children. That was kind of like Ike's getaway spot. And this also kept his flings away from her. Ike would take his side women and all of his flings and they would go to the studio and be with him there. Now I know that we are now talking about Tina in a very wholesome way, but she was not squeaky clean during this period. As a matter of fact, it is said from the mid 60s to the early 70s was her raunchiest period ever. Maybe they said that Ike and Tina Turner were just nasty at this point. And not only in their personal lives I'm talking about when they got on stage they said around this time when Ike and Tina performed at all black venues 
they got nasty, even nastier than Jackie Wilson. When Ike and Tina got on stage, Tina used to wear little old bitty, bitty short dresses. I mean, real short, booty cheeks hanging out, and then she wouldn't have on any panties with it, okay? So everything would be out, and she would just be shaking, literally shaking her stuff in everybody face chat. While I was doing my research, I was on a blog website and this came up on the blog website. And on one of the comments, somebody said that's the one thing that their dad remembers about Tina Turner is her stuff in his face and his daddy never forgot that. Like I'm pretty sure that was a standout moment in his life. So y'all know how silly I am, baby that took me out, you hear me? And that's raunchy. But honey, it got even raunchier. When Ike and Tina got on stage and performed I've Been Loving You Too Long, which is Otis Redding's song, Tina would be on stage with the microphone, basically acting like she was performing with the microphone. She's making gurgling sounds, she's screeching, she's mm, mm, doing all kind of sounds on that microphone. And while she's doing this, Ike is supposedly in the background making sounds like he's eating Yes, so they are both making these sounds like they are pleasuring each other and the audience is just like, oh, okay. This is another rumor that I have no problem believing out of all of these because there is footage on YouTube of Tina doing this very thing, except she was not doing it as hardcore as she was in front of the black clubs because this was in front of a white audience. But I'm gonna put the link in the description and y'all go ahead and watch Tina slurping and acting a fool on that microphone. And to me, it seemed like she was embarrassed doing all that. And she did say later on that Ike made her do these things. Another bit of tea is that Tina had plastic surgeries at this time. She got her teeth fixed and apparently she tweaked her face. I kinda knew that she got her teeth fixed, but I had no idea that she tweaked her face and her nose and cheeks and stuff like that. I did not know that. And then not only that, she supposedly also got breast implants. That's another thing I had no idea about. But when I look at her breast in this picture, it seems pretty clear that she did get implants somewhere along the line. Another thing that grew along with Ike and Tina's popularity was Ike's pension for messing with the Ike Ed. That's what he pretty much did in his spare time is rotate messing with the Ike Ed. Tina by this time is very hard hearted when it comes to stuff like that. Like she just turns a blind eye because Ike has been cheating this entire time and if it's to be believed that she actually got girls for him, why would she be bothered by Ike messing with the Ike Ed? She seemed so unbothered that when you look at her in this picture with Ann Thomas, it seems like they were cool. And the reason I bring this picture out is because Ann Thomas is said to be Ike's favorite Ike Ed. He was quoted saying that Ann Thomas looked much better than Anime Bullock. He didn't think that Tina could hold a candle to Ann Thomas, but let me tell you something, sir. You're totally wrong because Tina Turner was bad, was, is still bad. Do you hear me? And Ann Thomas is very beautiful, especially on this picture. But don't sit there and say that Tina Turner can't hold a candle to her. I didn't even think I was gonna have to say this in this video, but honey, I am gonna say somebody doing too much. I, right, you're doing too much, sir. You are doing too much. Trying to say that Tina couldn't hold a candle to Ann Thomas. Boy, you done lost your mind. Get out of here. Now, after saying everything that I've said so far, if it is true, any of this is true, it seems like Tina was living the way she thought she should live. She thought she should be all rough and tough and turn a blind eye and be this certain person to fit into the world of Ike Turner. And she may have even enjoyed it at first. The money, I want the fame, you know what I'm saying? It's cool, the drugs are cool, let's do this thing. But somewhere along the line, she did indeed become very disillusioned with the life that she was living. And that was in 1969 when she tried to commit suicide by taking an overdose of Valium. After this suicide episode, Ike Turner really proved how doggish and sorry and nasty he could be. Tina says that Ike said something to the effect of, if you don't pull through this, I'm gonna kill you. I will kill you, Ann, if you don't pull through. And that was displayed in the movie. Now Ike, on the other hand, says that he did not say this. He did not say this, but he did say something like, um, 
Well, if you really wanted to commit suicide, why didn't you just jump off a bridge? You know what I mean? That, that's a better way to kill yourself if you just jump off a bridge. If you want to stop a show, really kill yourself. Don't stop no show if you're not really going to die at the end. That's basically what he had told her. Or something to that effect. But he told the world this. Like, he was telling people he said this. Like, that made it any better. Just a dog, just nasty. And then the fact that he thought that this version was going to make things better. Sir! And then when he received backlash on that, where basically people were like, well, that's not good either, Ike. Why would you even say that? Oh, I was joking. I was joking with Ann. Ann, no, I was just playing with her. You don't play with somebody that's so broken they tried to commit suicide, Ike Turner. This man, Lord have mercy, Lord. After Tina gets well from the overdose, she does go back and join Ike, but things are not really the same. She's fed up, she's tired of this lifestyle, and she is definitely tired of Ike. And then in 1976, after the incident that played out in the movie, and for the people who have not seen What's Love Got To Do With It, basically what happened is that Ike and Tina had a show. They were in the car and they got into an argument and it turned violent. And sooner or later, they were beating on each other. You know, the movie portrayed it as Ike jumped on Tina and she started fighting him back. But some people say it was just like the regular fights that they had all the time, fighting each other just like they always did in the past. But this time, Tina was sick of it. She was tired of it. So when they got to the hotel, she waited until Ike fell asleep and she left. She ran away and she ran through traffic and she... Y'all remember that part in the movie? That part was kind of stupid a little bit. But anyway, she runs to another hotel. She's all beat up in the face, and she asks the hotel manager, can I get a room for the night? And he gives her a room for the night. After this was all over, she divorced him, and she kept her name. That's one version of the story, and I know you guys are like, oh, Lord, Ashley, what you got now? Everything that I just told you did happen, but they're saying that the reason that Tina was tired of it was not because of the beatings or anything like that. They said that she was tired of it because the Turner coffers were dry. The money was drying up. There was no more money when it came to Ike and Tina. They owed a lot of money. The shows were not bringing in what they used to. Tina could not do what she wanted to do anymore. And because now they have to save money. Tina ain't trying to do that. And I understand that. Let's say she was there for the money. Well, shoot, when the money dries up, what's left? Beating? Is you crazy? You think I'm gonna stay with you so you can beat on me and I can sing my life away and we ain't even got no money? Goodbye. When you see me, please act like you don't know me. And I hope ain't nobody out there crazy enough to say, but love, what about love, honey? What's love got to do with it? I'm pretty sure Tina had fell out of love with Ike a long time ago. The beatings and the cheating changed that. <laughs> the love was gone, baby. And now the money was gone and now Tina was gone. We're to the point Tina was free. She files for a divorce from Ike and it was granted. Ike kept everything that he thought still had some worth to it. They let Ike have all of that. Now let me tell y'all how this whole thing was a game, honey, and how Miss Tina played the game to perfection. You see, Ike thought it was he that had all the control. He dishing out the beatings, he finding folks five dollars every which way, but no, 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 no. It was Tina who had manipulated him out of the very thing that he needed to make it somewhere. The only thing that was worth something between Ike and Tina Turner was baby doll's name, Tina Turner. Yeah, she may have taken some beatings and some cheatings, but Baby Doll learned that business like she never had before. She gets back out there, she tours everywhere. I mean, anywhere that would have her. She's touring and she's putting on magnificent shows. And then what do you know? Important people start to come to those shows. People that can make her a superstar. And before you know it, Miss Tina Turner is back on the scene and baby, her music is white as ever. Now, Tina achieved this with the help of her husband. His name was Erwin Bach. And we're not about to get into the details of how her music built back up and all of the music details because that is not what this video is about. We are about to get into the details of some scandalous tea that happened around this time. Now, before Tina met Erwin, she already had some friends that were in very high places. Mysteriously, Ike's studio, his only source of income at this point was burned down and that was in the year 1981. Gossip on the street said that that night, wherever Miss Tina Turner was, she was smelling like gasoline, honey. <laughs> these folks is messy out here, especially these old folks, they had me rolling, y'all. 
basically they were trying to accuse Tina of burning down that studio. But although the police said it was arson, they never put a face to the arsonist. Soon after that happened, and while Tina was working on her comeback, she also was writing a tell-all book called I, Tina, which detailed her relationship with Ike Turner and her current comeback. And the world just could not believe that this lady was that strong. They could not believe that she had gone through hell and she had survived the way she did. So of course the book becomes a bestseller. They even made it into a movie which was called What's Love Got To Do With It. She was already a superstar, but those two things propelled her into the stratosphere. Tina Turner was bigger than life when those two things came out. And while all this was happening with Tina, Ike had to sit back and watch it, honey. He was burning up in the inside that he did not break her. He also was burning up that he could not be a part of this success and his feelings were hurt too. They were really hurt because Ike had always felt like everybody that he had brought up, they had gone on to achieve bigger things, but they always left him behind. And out of everything that people say, I did in fact teach Tina everything that she knew. He did build her up, he even named her. So Ike Turner does deserve props for that if nothing else. He did build her up. Let's just call it what it is, y'all. Anyway, though, Ike is burning up. Very hurt inside. He's seething inside. But Tina is not done with him yet, y'all. She's about to lay the final piece of the puzzle. She's about to scream checkmate on Ike Turner. That is when she destroys him, y'all. She destroys Ike. And get this. She doesn't even have to lift a finger to do it. After What's Love Got To Do With It, everybody wants to interview Ike Turner, okay? Everybody. They want to hear his side of the story. And Tina's assistants, entourage, minions, everybody that's around her are like, you know, should we try to do anything to stop these interviews? Should we try to do anything to keep him off TV? You know, should we really let him get on there like that? And Tina's just sitting back like, no. Let them get on TV. Don't try to stop a thing, y'all. And they're like, are you sure? Are you sure, Miss Turner? Yes, I'm sure. Don't stop a thing. Let him get on TV, I'm telling y'all. And they really could not understand why Tina was not even trying to block these interviews. Even if she couldn't, they couldn't understand why she didn't at least try. But see, <laughs> if you go back and you look at the interviews that Ike and Tina did in the 60s, the 70s, go look at those interviews. Tell me if Ike said more than one or two words. Ike didn't really say anything on those interviews. It was Tina who did all the speaking. You know why? Because Ike could not talk. Ike did not know how to express his opinions. He did not know how to use his words. Tina remembered this. She remembered this, y'all. And so she knew if she sat there and sat back and let Ike talk, he would destroy his own self and she would not have to lift a finger. That is exactly what happened. Baby, I got on TV sounding a hot mess, sounding like a fool. Didn't know how to pronounce his words. He did not know how to string together a coherent sentence. I mean, y'all, he sounded very, very dumb. He really did. And this is the thing that terrified Ike before. He had been terrified. That is why he let Tina do all the speaking back in the day, because he didn't know how to speak in public. But see, now he was so determined to clear his name that he wanted to finally open his mouth. But he should have got a representative of, or somebody else to speak for him. His vocabulary was that of maybe an elementary school student. And, and this is so sad because he tried to say things to defend himself, but it all came out like jumbled up and all wrong. And basically everything that he said was turned against him by the media. And they laughed in his face pretty much. You know what I mean? They had Ike Turner out here clowning himself. I'm gonna put links in the description of this video so you guys could go and watch at least one or two of the interviews that he did. I get secondhand embarrassment when I watch them because it's just that bad. I can get a sense of what he was trying to say, but he would say it all wrong. Every time he said something on those interviews, he implicated himself and made himself hate it more and more. And I'm sure while he was doing this, Tina was just sitting back like, good, let that mother sucker talk. And he did, y'all. Talked himself and his career right into a death spiral.
Anyway, y'all, let's get back to the story and let's get back to the tea. So the new and evolved Tina has just as much scandal as the old Tina. For one thing, there's a rumor out there that she slept around with David Bowie and Mick Jagger in order to secure her spot in rock and roll history. This next rumor was really new to me. I had no idea about this, but it involves Randy Jackson and his wife, Bernadette. So Randy was married to a woman named Bernadette and I guess he was beating on Bernadette or something like that. And Bernadette seeked comfort over with Tina Turner. And so she was over at Tina's house, but while they're talking, Randy drops by Tina's home and he's trying to get Bernadette to come home with him. And when she says she's not coming and nobody answers the door, Randy gets all mad and he picks up a flower pot and he throws it through the window. And so Tina picks up a gun and she came to where Randy was and they said she aimed the gun in his head and was like, freeze or I'll blow your brains out. And after she said it, she lifted the gun up towards the ceiling and she let off a round. Randy, who was still hyped up and very angry, apparently started running towards Tina. He started trying to charge her like a bull, but it said that Tina took the gun and fired towards the doorway. And then she took the gun again and aimed it at him. He hightailed it up out of that child, got in his car and left. We can look at this as just a story of an abused woman trying to be there and comfort another abused woman. But rumor says that Tina and Bernadette were actually in an intimate relationship with each other. And she liked Bernadette. She wanted Bernadette for herself. And that is why she was so eager to pull a gun on Randy Jackson. Now we are pretty much at the end of the old Hollywood scandals video when it comes to Tina Turner. But y'all know it can't be just easy like that. It's not just easy like that. You know what I'm saying? It can't be. So let me go ahead and add a couple of more rumors that have been said about Tina throughout the year. The first rumor is that Tina Turner now cannot stand black people. She does not like them. They said that she won't even have black people inside of her house. Allegedly, when they were casting for the color purple, Tina Turner was asked to play Suge Avery. She said, I wouldn't do a black picture if I was dying. It took me 20 years to get out of that black ass and I ain't going back. It is also said that Little Richard and Phil Spector blasted Tina Turner over Ike's funeral. And also her sister Eileen went to Ike's funeral because Eileen said that she still looked at Ike like a brother-in-law. But Phil Spector apparently got up there blasting her over her treatment of the black community, over her treatment of Ike's name, and the fact that she had gone over and basically started a whole new life and forgot about the people who made her become what she was. But the thing is, Phil Spector is not really one to talk because of the scandal that he has in his own life. Also, she once supposedly said in 1987 in a Rolling Stones magazine that she preferred light-skinned black men or white men. She did not want to date any type of dark-skinned black men, and I guess that was because of the treatment she endured from Ike. It is also said that she is a real piece of work. She tried this attitude Queen Bee stuff with Elton John. Elton, you're not getting the music right or something like that. And he told her, well, if you just sing the song in the right key, you wouldn't have to worry about the music. Don't mess with Elton John, baby. And one of the worst rumors is the fact that it said that Tina does not have anything to do with her grandchildren or her children. Like I think she still associates with her son, Ronnie, which is her son that she had with Ike. And I think she was still in contact with her son, Craig. But when it comes to those children that Ike had, that she raised, she really don't really have nothing to do with them. Like Ike Jr. and I forgot the other one's name. Those two, like she really ain't got nothing to do with them, period, point blank. And their children still refer to her as grandmother. As a matter of fact, it's supposedly a girl on Facebook and her name is Raquel Turner. And she said something to the effect of, yes, Tina Turner is my grandmother, but she has not been there for me the way a grandmother should, you know? But she said, I still respect and look up to my grandmother and everything she went through, blah, 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 something like that. But all I'm trying to say is that the girl did make a point that Tina Turner has nothing to do with them. And maybe she doesn't have anything to do with them because she feels like they are not her real grandchildren because that girl, Raquel Turner, is Ike Jr.'s child. So Tina, I guess, feels like, where, La where Lorraine at? Where Lorraine at? That's your grandmama, baby, not me. So I'm not saying that's a fact, but I'm guessing that is the way she feels. Where is Lorraine Taylor? Why y'all want me to be the grandmother?
Now, I think she did like give them some money at one point or paid they rent for like a year or something like that. I'm not sure. But I think she did give all of her children and her grandchildren some money at one point. But recently or up to this date, I don't feel like she has any type of real relationship with any of them so we are finally coming to a close of this video y'all oh my goodness i had to go all the way back and research stuff that i saw at least five years ago i had to go and find it and try to clip it and put it in this video but i think i found most if not all of that to give to you guys thank you guys so much for your patience go ahead and like share comment do whatever you can to this video. You guys know I love you and I know you guys love me back. I will see you next time. Bye.